Hello and welcome to a very special edition of the Royal Beat, where today we'll be looking back and paying tribute to the life and times of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. On April the 9th, uh, just after midday, Buckingham Palace released a statement that spoke of the Queen's deep sorrow at the passing of her husband at Windsor Castle at the age of 99. Prince Philip was the longest serving consort in British royal history and was at the Queen's side for more than six decades of her reign. During the show, we'll not only be taking a look back at the extraordinary life of the Duke, including all that he achieved um, during his, his life and his public service, but we'll also be drilling into some of the lesser known stories that talk of the man uh, away from public duty. And to help me to do that today, I'm joined by three of the very best, those that got to know him uh, across the course of their careers. Uh, the author, uh, of Prince Philip Revealed, a man of his century, Ingrid Stewart is with us. Robert Jobson, the royal biographer and author of Prince Philip's Century, The Extraordinary Life of the Duke of Edinburgh. And Russell Myers, the Daily Mirror's uh, royal editor. Good to have you all with us. Uh, as I alluded to that, you all got to work up close and personal with the Duke. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about, not so much the man that was reported, but Ingrid, the man that you got to know? Well, the Duke hated fuss and he, he didn't suffer fools. He was a very complete person. But uh, somebody that knew him much, much better than me said, actually, he's completely unknowable. But as a result, of course, he was a very complex, and I thought a very fascinating man, because if you couldn't know him, you were always wanted to know more about him. Mm. I mean, the very first time I met him, he was incredibly rude to me. Was he? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. Well, I was, uh, I was in, in uh, a man at, at a, in a, it was a royal tour. And in those days, we all got to meet the people that we were writing about. And it was my very, very first royal tour ever. And we, we were in the British Embassy. Anyhow, um, they announced our names, Ingrid Seward, Hanover Magazines, who published Majesty then. So he thought, ah, oh, she's German. <laughs> I'll be able to talk to her. <laughs> so, so he came up to me, or his aquarium came up and said, oh, His Royal Highness would like to talk to you. And I thought, ooh, he's picked me out of everybody here. And he came up to me and said, you German? And I said, no. And he just turned around and walked away. <laughs> turned on his heel. <laughs> turned on his heel. And he did that with a lot of people. But um, He was never out to make friends, was he? He knew that... Uh, and he was always keen to drill this into the younger royals. You're representing the role. You're not a celebrity. People turn out to see you because of the role that you serve. And it's not even the role that you play. Uh, so he was never there to make fast friends, was he? He had a lot of friends, made a lot of friends, not necessarily in the media, but... No. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think the, you know, the Duke was on the level, really. He was... Um, he would be able to deal with people from any, from any walk of life. I mean, he was president of my club, the In and Out Club, and I was at a dinner there, and you had to be a member for 15 years or so, and he, he spotted me in the line and he said, what on earth are you doing here? And I said, well, I can go if you want. And he goes, no, you might as well stay and eat, not that you need it. And then, <laughs> and then another That's one is said... That's what he said to you. Yeah, and, I, and everyone's looking, and they're all looking around, you know. So he must have recognised like, you, Robert, from being on the well, Royal the other Road thing, he, he, Yeah, and he, we were at another th event, and, um, <laughs> and he came over. I was with two that. Irish, quite eminent Irish correspondents, and he spotted them, and he saw their badges, and he, I was standing with him. I was with the Sun at the time, and I had my in-and-out tie on Naval Military Club time. And he said, oh, what are you wearing that for? He said, God, they let anyone in these days. And, that's... <laughs> and then he saw these two Irish correspondents, and they were like, editors of, you know, quite high level. It was a big reception. He started to proceed to tell a, a pretty, you know, uh, unsuitable joke about the Irishman who was piloting a plane. So, I mean, he was... And then, and, you know, he, was, he is terribly funny. Then he was along the line, there was a guy called Martin Townsend, who was editor of the Express, the Sunday Express at the time, and he thought he'd made a friend, but he said, oh, you're from the Express, I knew Arthur Christensen. Brilliant man, brilliant editor. Well, of course, Arthur Christensen was at his, um, was at his uh, Belfry stag do, and along with a lot of other journalists. Oh, yes, of course. And uh, he, he said, well, I come from a long line of eminent editors. He said, well, I never said that. <laughs> so he was in you know, a terribly, I think... But he knew exactly what he was doing when he was doing those things, and um, I, I think he was... A terrific guy, you know. And what, what I say was on the level, a lot of people that spoke to him, you know, there was, you know, you know it could be anybody. They didn't care. He, even with the servants, you know, he would be, you know, he'd have fights with the chefs over the barbecue about something. They'd always take, the, the chefs would always say, look, 
There's not a, he never does enough meat for the barbecue. He, he never brings enough. So the chefs had always put in extra steaks and sausages and everything, an extra bag. Of course, the Duke has worked this out to the minute degree of what course, he wanted being to a military do. Man, so he yeah. knew exactly what he needed. And so, of course, when they came back, there were like several steaks left and things like that. And he was driving back one of the chefs. And he said, <laughs> What's in that bag? It was nothing, nothing, sir. What's in the bag? It's said, what, well, nothing, sir. And he opens it up and he sees there's like half a dozen steaks and sausages, <laughs> which are obviously going back somewhere amongst the staff. <laughs> so he grabs the bag and throws it out of the car. Oh, that's no. wonderful. But there, but there was one other thing, one other story, but everyone thinks he was bad with the media. But there was, there was one moment, a friend of mine, a journalist, two freelance photographers for The Sun, they were up in Scotland, Balmoral, this, you know, as you were, you're sent up there to, to get the, the pictures of them. No, they can't see them, do they? So being photographers, one of them's got a new BMW. They decide to go up to Lot Mick to get a nice backdrop for their cars to take some pictures. At that moment, the Duke comes along, totally on his own, no bodyguard anyone, with his little boat on the back and his fishing gear, spots them by the BMW, thinks they're two police officers off duty, and he shouts, are you two off duty? And they went, oh, Christ, it's him. <laughs> and then he said, oh, we're off duty, yeah. Are you off duty? Well, we're from the sun, sir. Well, that doesn't matter. Just unload the boat and get it into the, into the lock. <laughs> so he, he, they then proceed to unlock the boat uh, and get it off of the thing, put it in the lock. Um, and he says, I'll tell you what, as you've done that, in about half an hour, if you stick around, I'll start pulling some fish out and you can send them back to London, the pictures. That's fine. And that's exactly what happened. And they got all these exclusive pictures and he was fine with it. You know, that's the different side of him, really. He's got a great sense of humour and I think that's really what kept the Queen oh, yeah. sane. Giggling. Giggling, yeah. I mean, he is just so the, quick the, the, the and funny. They're never knowing what he's going to say to whom in which environment, and I think that, yes, you're quite right, she she clearly delighted in his company. And, and delighted, but also get fed up with him sometimes. I mean, you know, <laughs> she, she was, when he was ranting and raving on the Royal Yacht Britannia, Lord Charter said, didn't he, that she wouldn't come out of her cabin. She said, I'm not coming out until he calms down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did speak of her incredible tolerance, <laughs> didn't he? Um, Russell, uh, your thoughts and... Uh, any, any moments you'd like to share well, you, in your time? You know what, a lot, a lot of my experience is, is, uh, is anecdotal. I've spent a lot of time speaking to, to people who knew him for, for many decades working for him in the palace or, uh, or spoke to him at just a fleeting moment. And yeah. what I would say is from, from mm. those people that uh, they spoke of him with universal pride, that he made them feel special. Of course, he would be bellowing at certain people at certain times and admonishing them. But uh, when it mattered, uh, he really took people close in. And there was a, a particular story about uh, one of the mechanics at Balmoral, um, that his, his young son would come up to, uh, to, to the stables where they would fix, fix the cars, essentially. And uh, he created this huge, great friendship with him over about mm. a decade or more. Um, and it was just, and, and none of that would have been known. It was never to, yeah. um, never with f fanfare. And I think that's just a very, very kind man, essentially. Um, you know, perhaps went off the handle at certain times, but uh, just ha had that really nice nature about him. So let's play in a clip here then of, of that fateful day. Um, so this was a visit with her parents, uh, King George and Queen Elizabeth, and a, a very young Margaret uh, to the Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. That's the day but, they say but, it all began. But she was 13. Okay. She was so very I mean, And he was, what, 18. He was 17, 18. So 18. He was 18. So, yeah. so, you know, although they say that she was in love with him for that moment, and, and she may well have been fallen for him, you know, he, he's, he, you know, he was a young man who, who would not be really interested in a 30 year old girl. He's been very polite. And so all the, when he was then going on with his neighbour career and other girlfriends that he would have had, it was perfectly natural. He says he never really thought of the princess romantically That's until, until at the end of the war, really, even though they would write to each other. Uh, and they they would write to each other, but she also wrote letters to Earl Spencer you know, and other people that were at war. But she obviously had a, a, an effect. Diana's uh, father. Yeah, they obviously had an affection for, for each other, but uh, maybe her more than him. But well, I, think he, so, he I think he didn't he didn't yes, think yes. of her in that way. Now Dickie Mountbatten, on the other hand, the great manipulator and schemer, he would have been thinking about it probably from the moment he was born. What I was think, his agenda, yes. though? You know, you, you talk about Mountbatten's agenda, agenda here. Agenda, well, be, the name Mountbatten being the house of Mountbatten. He was very, very ambitious for, for, his, for his young nephew. And 
uh, all Prince Philip's sisters had, uh, had married German nobility. Aristocrats. Uh, aristocrats, yes, and they all, not they all, but I think three out of four of them lived in huge castles. But it would make Mountbatten, what was his ambition? With the, with the king yes, dying his... very young, he becomes the almost patriarchal figure of the dynasty of, um, of the house of, as he hoped it would be, as we the both house know, the house of Mountbatten, which eventually wasn't that because there was a big row about it, but the fact was that's what he saw it to be, yeah. Now, they, kept, they maintained a friendship, as you say, through the war years as pen pals, because that's pretty really, much the yeah. only line of communication that was open then. So then when did that friendship turn to romance and, and they did yeah, the relationship was, I think forward. about the end of... Towards the, when, towards the end of the war, um, they, they, he, was, he was invited a few times as, you know, a cousin, Prince Philip of Greece, to, he to went Windsor. to Windsor Castle, and he did actually one time see uh, Princess Elizabeth performing those famous pantomimes when yes. she was Aladdin. And we know all this because of Marion Crawford, who, who wrote the book The she, Two Princesses, yeah, yeah. which is the only record we have at the time. But she also, they, they also then would have, at the same time, you've got to bear in mind, this is why the, the story of them meeting at 13 and it is the, the tabloid story. And the, but, you know, the Queen Mother, who used to refer to Philip as the Hun, you know, she, she was Why? busy. Why? Well, because, because he was, she was German. German and her brother had been... I mean, terribly girlfriend. politically yeah. incorrect. Yeah, not in that, those days. That's Way what she referred to him as. I can't edit it. That's what no, no, her I majesty understand. called him. Yes. But she, she <laughs> referred to him as the Hun. And therefore, therefore, she was doing her best to put all these quiet... Um, Wah -wah. Landed, <laughs> the right landed sort, gentry, you know, yeah. <laughs> Earls and lords of a certain type that would be very gracious, probably Eton educated, very long families. Guards, up alternatives, Guards officers yes. would be seated next to the Queen while they're at Windsor, you know, when, during the war. She was very and, keen and, on and the, and the producing king, these guards you know, the, officers. The King just yeah. didn't want to lose his daughter because, you know, the point of it is the King, you know, was just like all fathers, protective of his daughter. And then you've got Mountbatten, who's who's basically telling, stick with me, son, you're going to go a long way. Yes. <laughs> and, I mean, so much so that when Philip just got his, onto his first ship, um, the, he told the captain, the captain then, that he was close, to, he was going to marry. Yes, that was extraordinary. He was going to marry um, the Princess Elizabeth. Confidence. When he was 18. Well, co yes, because he's... Well, that's the weird thing. Was it confidence or was it no, because he'd been told by Mountbatten well, that's 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 going to happen? He wasn't in love with, with her then, but pretty much she was that... You know, and this clear is absolutely, about it. this is in naval records. He wrote, a, he wrote a book that was unpublished, but he said it. And therefore, you can see that although Philip, when did he fall in love with her? I would think he, when he told Mountbatten to stop interfering. Yes. And he went up to Balmoral, and he's, there was a clear attraction between the two. And, you know, he proposed in secret, of course. I mean, at the Balmoral. King, at Balmoral. Yeah. And I don't think he even sought permission from the king first. He did it afterwards. Well, we, we, but one day we'll know, but yeah. none, none of us know but that. But then he popped the question that. to her. And, and then, you know, he, the king said, well, that's fine, but she's too young, and we'll keep this engagement secret until we're ready. For another two years, so she had so to they, wait yeah. two years. Because they really were oh, not... no, no, she... One she year. Had, one yeah, year. And had, there is the engagement yeah. ring, um, which he then followed up with an incredibly... Beautiful bracelet. So the ring was was quite considered. But it all came from his mother's jewelry. And he designed the bracelet. And he designed it, which yes. was one of his passions. But the bracelet that he gave her was, I mean, really quite. Oh, Russell's bling. very good on bracelets. <laughs> yes, come <laughs> on, Only Russell, with, with your yeah, royal yeah. knowledge well, of the uh, jewelry. Exactly collection. what uh, Ingrid was saying. This is from like his mother's line, wasn't it? It was. I know that he'd. Well, she smuggled some jewelry uh, out, didn't she? I think it she was had from her it. tiara. That, yeah. That, that, yeah, it was he, the tiara. He redesigned the ring and, and the bracelet from gems from her. From her tiara mm. and possibly he, he didn't other really, jewelry. He didn't really have a lot to offer the Queen, did he? He was well, uh, widely reported as kind of a yeah. man. Well, in terms of at the royal court, the finance, yeah, that, that he would not have been the richest heiress no. in the world. Yes, exactly. They would have said, yeah, he looks great, but he's got nothing. No, he's, he was a great grand. Son of the Queen Victoria, the great bloodline. Funny. What I think but she liked about him. Why were they so opposed to him then, Robert? Was it because he had no because, money? Because. No, I don't think it was that. I think it was the Mountbatten factor that it was being forced upon. And the upon fact it. that he, he was considered... Well, remember, this was just after, only just after the Second World War, and he was considered very and foreign. We had to change his... He had to change his name, he had to change his citizenship. Because of the German conversation. Yeah. But, and, and also, Mountbatten, again, behind the scenes, as soon as he'd done the secret engagement and they went off to South... The King said, let's come 
go to South Africa on this tour and took the Queen with him. And Pat was busy amongst all the journalists that he knew, the editors, the politicians that he knew, convincing them that this man was not, uh, you say his real Glucksburg, I can never get it Glucks right. Yes, Holstein Glucksburg. Holstein Glucksburg, whatever it is. He, then he transformed from being this German sounding Danish, Greek, whatever, Rolf, to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, RN, mentioned in dispatches. See, um, he was christened in the Greek Orthodox Church as Philippos. <laughs> and he had the incredibly grand christening. I mean, he was very grand. And I think the reason... Very that... interesting hearing all of this, because mm -hmm. some of it jars with a lot of what has been reported across But I think the what's years. happened is because it's all been made into this sort of... The fairy tale, tabloidy, tale, fairy yes. tale okay. thing, and yeah. and actually, the, when did they fall in love? I think that why did she fall in love? You show those pictures of the, of the engagement, because he would do things that were totally irreverent, wouldn't he? And he would upset her father. I mean, even when they went to Dartmouth that we were talking about, they were so, you know he they were all rowing out with the, the royal yacht. Oh yes, yes. Uh, and and he would continue rowing so much so that he was going right out to sea, and the king's going that bloody fall. <laughs> you know, he's going to, you know, he's, he's going to get back. And she thought that was great. But here, if you watch that footage, because I watched it the other day, um, and all the time he's saying things that are it, clearly in a... You know, in a program, program. Yeah. And she giggles. <laughs> yeah. She's trying to behave herself, like be all formal. And then he says something, and her shoulders go up, and, and she just laughing, puts her tongue yeah. in her, like that, and she's just laughing. The, you know, these ones are probably a little more stilted, but you watch that one when she was moving, and he's... He makes her giggle all the time. All the time. He's flirting yeah. with her all the time. Let's talk about, um, obviously, th they married when she was still a princess. Uh, Charles and Anne were born during that time. And the family were stationed in Malta as a result of his work with the Navy, which she's described as incredibly happy a, a time in their married life. Oh God, I've possibly one of the most happiest, I think. Uh, completely carefree. The, the future was years and years uh, ahead of them. Um, and unfortunately, that was... You know, cruelly taken away from them. That's what they thought at the time. They were dealing with some great, uh, inc incredible grief, but then their lives were absolutely turned upside down. And not only uh, the Queen thought that um, their, their whole future had been railroaded, I mean, he was absolutely bereft because he thought, you know, it's, things are going to get absolutely serious now. But a clip of him talking about that change and what ultimately it meant to him uh, at a point where he was really flying high with the Navy and had to make the decision to step down. Let's take a look. Um, but he was kind of a minister with that portfolio and had to kind of invent a role for himself, which he went on to do remarkably, actually. But it can't always have been easy, and it must have brought a lot of strain onto the relationship. I think it did. I mean, it did, didn't it, Job? I mean, he... No question, yeah. he, he could have gone all the way to the, to, to the top of the, of the Navy, and that's why he was saying he was just about to get to the most well, interesting it... part of his career and, uh, and then had to... Well, he didn't have to, have to make a decision. It was made for him. Yeah. Um, when he was younger, he said, um, that it's all about what-ifs, that. And he said, you know, what if, what if. And that he, he said, actually, if he'd gone his way, he'd have probably been signed up as a fighter pilot. And if that had been the case, he'd probably been dead because most mm. fighters yeah. signed, signed up in 1939, most of them died. So, you know, what if I could have been how long's a piece of string, as he said there? You know, the bottom line is, you know, that's how he thought. He, he's a pragmatic. And also, he thought that as he had relinquished his naval career, he really was going to do his bit for the Queen. He said first, second, and third. His duty was to look after her because she represented the monarchy, which is why later in, in their lives he got so upset with the younger members of the royal family mm. because he felt they were bringing the monarchy into disrepute. But I think also... Especially the queen, when he'd so. given up so much. He'd given up... They, and the Queen, they gave up... Really, they gave up their private life. Of course. She gave up she being that a that mother. Was, I mean, they both knew it was coming, surely. However, they thought it they had a slightly longer soon, run yeah. 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 at yeah. it, where he would have been yeah. able to yeah. realise more of his professional self. Yeah, but let's, let's yeah. move on to what he did go on to achieve in his role as consort, but which he performed with great diligence. He carried out a staggering 22,191 solo engagements in seven decades. He gave five... 5,493 speeches, was patron president or member of 837 organisations, travelled to 143 countries on official business and only stopped working at 96. Quite well, you, some going. You talk about um, like uh, a... without portfolio, there was no blueprint for oh. it at all. And especially at his age, he had to completely make it up on his own. And but when uh, you compare what he did with what the Queen Mother did in that, that role, I suppose. Of course, and, and taking on those responsibilities undoubtedly uh, 
uh, he, he got frustrated with it at times. There was no one to really um, help him. So he just took it upon himself and, and, and sorted it out on his own. And, that, and that's when, yeah, you know, create, right. you create your own legacy. That's, well, that's, that's even more spectacular. Being queen consort is a different Very thing different, to being... Yeah. You know, the print, the I don't think it would material. be today, but certainly then. I it don't was. know. I, I think it's different. You, you are queen consort. You are. It's a more. It's, it's a more elevated role. He went in. I think for the first three years, you know, he was very much. You know, they were working together because they were trying to find their feet. You know, mm. and she had Churchill, of course, and she had. But after a while, she became quite established as monarch and didn't need him quite as much, and therefore. That's when we had that thing in '56 when he went off on the, that great well, voyage. She, was, she she knew that he was a super attractive man. She wanted to make sure we had something to do. Mm -hmm. So that's why at the very very early part of their marriage he became ranger. Uh, of yeah, Windsor they divided it up, didn't they? Yeah. Incredible what he did with Windsor because it had kind of been left to rack and ruin to some degree. I mean, to well, some he degree. Did, but he did. After was all over it, Victoria yeah, and yeah. Albert had, were really the last family to, to live there. In fact, you know, it was where his mother was born witnessed by Queen Victoria and then he really grabbed the ball by the horns with Windsor Park and he was that's where a lot of his innovation started which then we saw bleed through to all manner of his work but let's talk about the Duke of Edinburgh Awards because that goes jumping around now that goes back to his school days it goes back to is it Hans who who came it's up Han. with it? Han came up with the idea and I mean what he's I think for me you tell me if you feel differently. That is truly one of his great legacies. The he Duke did. Of I mean, what he was Wars. great at was getting people together. He got um, the uh, commander of the Everest expedition uh, yeah. together. He got all these people together, and he would say, "Look, what I did was bring everyone together." And yes, they, they did the work. It, he yeah. wouldn't take the credit. No. But what what, he, what what he achieved, you know, he would say, "Well, this is not me. It's not, it's not my name." But he brought the right people together. And he wanted and to help ethos. you. Yeah. yeah, he wanted to help to the fulfil their young role. People. Yeah. Yeah. It was he called it what, what he called uh, the work of the the scheme was to give them DIY skills uh, to go into adult life. Did you do it? Um, I did it. My son does really? it next did year. Did you? What level did you reach? Uh, gosh. Gold was it? Or did you get silver or bronze? <laughs> <laughs> I got gold to it, but it's not in my nature. Yeah. No, Russell, did you do it? I did. Uh, what did yes. you get? Bronze. Did you? Well, you oh, have to no. play the drums. And get attracted. <laughs> it's, 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 what about you? No, I didn't do no, it. No, I didn't do it. Either, yeah, yeah. No. But you know what? <laughs> you don't do it, do with, with, with great respect, you know, our generation, it was a new, it was a new. Oh, so he tried yeah. it. He got to the last stage. All he had to do was bang a drum or something. But, don't be but just, just, just on that point of saying your generation, um, not only, I mean, it's a big, huge legacy, but over three million young people have done it. Uh, oh, four million. Four, four million. Um, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards uh, was inundated so much this week yeah. that the website crashed. Yeah. So that tells you about a legacy of a man who's not only and brought I, generations it of just, kids through genuinely, it. Genuinely, it does mean a lot to people that have experienced it. I did, you did, mm, my yeah, son will. Great. Teenagers across the UK, across well, 140 nations Around I think it's gone to. Yeah. Mm, it's well um, well, so it. let's take a little look at him talking about the, uh, the concept and the conception yeah. of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. We know that he's a, a very modest man. Uh, in fact, his his wife stood up and spoke with that famous speech about her him being her strength and stay, saying he's not one for compliments. And he certainly doesn't like to take a lot of credit, but I think we can all agree that that was really quite something. And actually, without the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, would there have been a prince's trust? And then you start to look at how many millions of teenagers have benefited across the years from his and Charles's work. That's, that's quite an achievement. And he also did the National Playing Fields at a time after yeah. the war um, when they, there was no places for boys to kick a football apart from in the streets. You know, he, he realised that and got involved in the National Player yeah, Association. Which was a huge, huge thing. Huge thing, yeah. probably bigger than... The Duke of the Edinburgh Awards took a long time to get going, really. But, well, not a long time, a while. But the National Playing Fields, he was passionate about that. Mm. Because after the war, you got kids playing on the, you know, I mean, the wrecks. The there was no... There was on no, the bomb no, sites. Yeah. And, you know, you know it's, in my feeling, it's no... Um, down to that, you know, we won the World Cup in 1966. A lot of those boys that were playing on the streets would have been starting to play in field, proper yeah. football pitches we down have, to him. Yeah, we have to remember the, the social history of that time, which was emerging from a very bombed and, and ruined Britain but, that was rebuilding itself. It was and true. sport has always been a great uh, passion for him, but also a great way to bring people together. Um, let's talk about him very quickly as a father. What was he like as a father? And was he a different father to Charles and Anne than he was? Many years later with Edward and Andrew. He was. I think he was a different father with Charles and Anne. Um, he, he, being a very... He was only 26 when he had Charles. And um, 
he wanted a son in his own image. I don't know if you're like that, Jobbo, but he wanted... No, I don't want him uh, in my image. My he son. wanted a, a son in his own image, which, which was, again, it's a time... You know, this was 1948. And Charles was a gorgeous little baby, but as he grew up, he was very, very shy. And he was very hesitant. And he, he was frightened of his father. I, I, his... I think that's true, but I think he misunderstood his son's temperament character because, you know... The, the fact is, yes, he would see that Anne was boisterous and outgoing, but I think that Prince Charles is very, like the Queen, has a steel core. And yes, he was a very but... strong, but, but he was shy. And he was very overly pampered by the Queen Mother. And I think that that was this conflict but between the two, the, wasn't the it? nanny... Well, people... A te sort of contemporary accounts of the time from people say that Prince Philip was very, very hard on Charles. 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 And he wanted... I remember there's one lo wonderful story about he wanted to teach Charles to swim, so he picked him up and threw him in the Buckingham Palace swimming pool. And Nanny, Nanny, My Nanny had a fit. My father did that to me. <laughs> oh, that's why you are the way you are. <laughs> no, he did. It takes a lot, Joffo. <laughs> but I think there were, there was a genuine feeling that they um, came together towards their final... Well, towards oh, there's no doubt in the last oh, year. Yeah. So yeah, let's take yeah. a little look at what Charles had to say when he took to the steps of Highgrove uh, to pay tribute to his late father. We forget, we've, you know, we, the Queen's lost her husband, Charles has lost his father, and we talk about the Duke of Edinburgh, but to, to them he was dad, he was husband, he was grandfather, he was great-grandfather. I mean, I think that was... I mean, although I didn't like the fact that he had to speak... He had to come out of the house and speak. I thought he, he, when he spoke about the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret, he did it from his study. I thought that was, like... I felt a bit... Sorry for Prince Charles doing the way well, he did Prince that. Prince Charles didn't his father, you yeah. see. Yeah, I thought it was quite human. He came did out you, and he I, I did. No, I, no, I, just want, I felt sorry for him. People wanted painful. to see him. And they hadn't no, no, seen no, no, no it was right that he was speaking, but I just felt that the fact that it was done in a press conference way, a, a press news... Mm. Maybe it's the way that it's, it's done. Whereas Anne opted... I mean, obviously, Charles is now... Patriarch, effectively. Yeah. Exactly, right. yes. Yeah. Patriarch, if we can call it that. Princess Anne said, you know it's going to happen, but you're never really ready. Sure, my father has been my teacher, my supporter and my critic, mm. but mostly he is my example of a life well lived and a service freely given that I most want to, uh, wanted to emulate. Um, beautiful talked, words. Really. Yeah, really beautiful words. And you, you, we know that they shared a very special bond. They certainly did, yes. I mean, I think she was really the... the, the she was the son that... He, he wanted Charles to be. She, you know, she was brave. She didn't mind when he, you know, when he told her off. She took no notice. She would answer him back. And um, when when he took them riding, um, you know, she was obviously a better rider than Charles. But it was just everything, and they had this, they shared the same humour. And I've seen her giving speeches. I'm sure you have, Jobbo, uh, and you, Russell. I mean, she's just like her father. <laughs> she really is. Yeah, she is brilliant. She's brilliant. That. But I think that narrative about them. This, I think in the end, in the last decade or so, but particularly in the last five years since or last since he retired and had more time, I think the Prince of Wales and Philip of Fung a lot of common ground, a lot of mutual respect, mm -hmm. and they've come to understand it. They came to understand each other a lot more, even to the point where the farms at, at Windsor, the home farms at Windsor and Sandringham, have been, yeah. become organic. And and the, and and Philip acknowledged it, it's, it's Charles's time now, uh, but even on other issues. But I think a lot of people forget that he started a lot of those conversations around conservation. He was. The oh no! But the difference they used to dif they have a massive difference over organic farming and. Um, uh, and, and sure. um, genetically modified. Whereas the Duke, so the Duke, does Prince William. Yeah, with the yes. Duke of Edinburgh believed fully that you know you need, to, you need to feed people. Yeah. Was, and, and, and so it, they had a difference over it. But in terms of the narrative on the planet, the, Prince, the Duke of Edinburgh was so far ahead of his time. Yeah. Uh, but you know he wasn't, as he would say, a tree hugger. He was a a believer in, uh, you know, practical, he, you know, practical yeah. conservation is different to... But he, I mean, even in the 50s, saving he, was, everything. he was hosting science documentaries talking about this stuff, you know. He said something wonderful. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, 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 go on. One of the... It was the very last interview I think he ever gave, and it was to Radio 4, and they were talking about conservation. He said, of course, the biggest problem I see it in the world today is, is overpopulation, people, yeah. which is also Sir David Attenborough's uh, big, big cry. Um, and he said... But, Char but he's very up about it. He said, but, you know, I think whatever problems arise about our lack of food, science will solve them. So he was very 
positive, Prince Philip. Thank you, sir, to the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, thank you join, for joining us on this show as we've sat back, talked and appreciated the man and his many contributions. Uh, thank you, Robert, to Ingrid and to Russ. We'll see you very soon. Take great care.